Hello everybody, welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. Before we begin, I just want to say that I hope you guys are doing well, hanging in there after a rough week two. I know week two sucks for a lot of students, 3D vectors, it's not the, not the most fun thing, but I got good news, week three is going to be much better and much more simple. I got my, my Pizza Planet shirt on, and if I'm wearing a Pizza Planet shirt, how can things be bad, right? Like, Pizza Planet, wonderful, Therefore, week three must also be wonderful. So I want to associate week three with good things because week three actually sets the stage for the rest of the course. All right, so week three is going to be very important moving forward. And the reason why is because now that we have a good idea of what force vectors are in both 2D and 3D, we can start to analyze them and find the applications of these force vectors. In structural engineering, buildings have forces all around us. It's what we do with these forces that make engineering fun because with forces we can start to design things. And I know that's what you guys all want to do is design things. So the question becomes, all right, I now know what force vectors are. I have a good idea. What can I do with these force vectors? So the whole goal of week three is going to be analyzing applications with these force vectors. Now, we, ha we, have, to, we have to start slow. We can't just jump right into it. And the first thing that we have to cover when we're analyzing force vectors is free body diagrams. So this is going to be the topic of today's video, but it's going to come up again and again because no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we are going to need a free body diagram. And this is going to be important to you guys because the first thing that all professors check when they mark exams, how is the student's free body diagram? So let's discuss what these free body diagrams are. So before we begin, oh. Have to, have to start the clicker. All right, guys, had a little clicker malfunction, but it's good to go now. Let's jump right in. So the first thing that we are going to discuss is the concept of force equilibrium. So this is something I'm going to introduce to you guys now, and it's something we are going to evolve later on and discuss many different aspects of. So in the past videos, we mainly focused on determining vector components, and then with those components, we determined resultant vectors for both 2D and 3D scenarios. But again, we never really discussed what we can do with this or what are the implications of this. So a common example is be, let's say that we have a nice steamed bun or a bow in two dimensions, so it's in the XY plane. And in week one and two, all we would do is we'd say that this is experiencing a number of forces and we would figure out the resultant force based on those three forces. And we kind of just left it at that. We said the resultant force is this, I'm happy, I got my marks, I'm good to go. But we never really said what this resultant force does. Well, if an object has a non-zero resultant force on it, it's going to start to move. So what's going to happen is this bow, if it has a non-zero resultant force, it's actually going to start to move in the direction of that resultant force. Now the key here is it actually will start to accelerate. So it's not going to move with a constant velocity, it's actually going to start accelerating in that direction. So this brings us to the idea of equilibrium. Now, a particle is in equilibrium if one of two things. First, the particle is in originally at rest and remains at rest, or the particle is moving in a straight line with a constant velocity and remains moving in a straight line with a constant velocity. Now, the constant velocity, you guys are thinking, okay, yeah, that makes sense. If it's constant, it's not accelerating. But why a straight line? Well, something is moving in a straight line, the only way it would change direction is if I put some forces on it. So if we put some forces on it, things are going to start accelerating. We don't want that. Now for this particular course, we're going to be focused on the first one, which is a particle is originally at rest and remains at rest, which is called the static case. And this makes sense. If we look at the video's description, I call this course engineering statics because we're always dealing with things that are at rest. But what does this imply if things are static? Well, Newton's second law of motion states that an object is at rest, or static, if the acceleration is equal to zero. What does this mean? Well, the net force on the object must actually be equal to zero because, that, because we know that a force is equal to mass times acceleration, and if the acceleration is zero, well, therefore, the resultant force on these objects must be equal to zero. And that's going to be kind of the main piece of information we are going to use for the rest of this course. Because before we had all of our vector components and we wanted the resultant force. Moving forward, we're saying we want things to be static, so that resultant force, that actually must be equal to zero. 
This means that I can start solving backwards for those vector components. And we're going to talk about that later on. So again, the, the, <laughs> the first thing I said we need to do when we start analyzing these four systems is we have to do something called a free body diagram. This can be very important. And this is basically a drawing of our situation which allows us to solve for the forces inside of a structure. Now, free body diagrams, they sound pretty crazy, but they're actually very simple. It is a sketch of a body or parts of a body that have been removed from its surroundings. And that removed from its surroundings is actually going to be very important, as I will show you. Now, free body diagrams actually include two things. So when you guys are drawing them in exams or assignments, remember that professors are going to be looking for two things. The first one is that the free body diagram contains all the forces acting on the body. So this will include weight, support reactions, applied forces, and even though I don't list it, it's going to also include things like internal forces, which we will discuss later. So that's going to be the first thing. Make sure you throw all your forces on this free body diagram. The second thing is it has to have all relevant dimensions. So that would include things like lengths as well as things like angles. The goal of the free body diagram, and this is how you get top marks. I know you guys all want the secrets to getting those top marks. The, the goal to getting top marks is that for your free body diagram, you should be able to solve the question directly with your free body diagram. You shouldn't have to draw your free body diagram and then keep referring back to the original figure. You should have your free body diagram and that should be all you need to solve the question. Now you guys may be thinking, all right, Clayton, well, it doesn't sound too bad. Can you give me an example? Well, of course I can. Let's say that we have this little crane structure. And for some particular reason, I don't know why, maybe I'm just bored. I want to analyze this particular piece of the crane structure. So this is where that first part of the free body diagram comes in, where I say we remove it from its surroundings. On the left hand side, we have the entire crane, but I'm just focusing in on a little piece of that crane. Now, the first thing to do is to label all the forces on the body. And this is where things might get a little bit confusing for students. Some are obvious, but some are not so obvious. So if we look at the crane, it's holding up a big weight. Well, we know that weight is simply mass times gravity. So we know on that rope, there's going to be a force pulling the crane downwards, which is simply the mass of that weight multiplied by gravity. That's a simple one. Most of you guys are thinking, Clayton, ah, this is a piece of cake. Now, where it's going to become new for a lot of students is this idea right here. If our free body diagram cuts any sort of member, we have to replace that member with forces. Now you guys are just saying, oh, hold on, Clay, what? What did you say? Well, if we look at our free body diagram on the left side, we can see that we actually cut through two of the members. I circled them with purple there. Now, when we cut through these members, we actually have to replace it with its internal forces. And the internal forces produced are going to vary depending on what kind of member we have. For this particular lecture, and we're going to talk a bit about it, we're going to talk more about it later, we're dealing with truss members, and they're the simplest form. If we cut through a truss member, we simply replace it with an axial load that's pointed away from our member. So as we can see here, we cut through two of the members, but for each member, we just replaced it with a single force, and it, we say that it's directed away. Now, it doesn't always have to be directed away, so that's something to keep in mind, but we're going to talk more about that later. Now, this is the first thing where students start to make mistakes, is when I mark exams, this is the most common free body diagram I see. It has all the forces, which is great, but it doesn't have all the dimensions. So for this to be a complete free body diagram, we're going to have to include dimensions. So I would do things like the length of the crane, as well as the angle the crane makes, something like that. You want to have it as complete as possible in order to get all those marks. Again, free body diagrams are going to be prevalent in almost every midterm question as well as final question. So making sure that we get these nice easy marks is going to be critical. Part marks all the way. As you guys are going to see, that's the best way to do well in exams. Just try and get part marks everywhere. Now, let's do a different example. Let's say that we want to analyze uh, the bottom of this crane. Well, the first thing that we know is we cut through two of the members just like before. So we're going to have to replace those with uh, axial forces. A second thing that we're going to talk about a little bit later in this video is the crane has to be supported. If the crane's not supported, well, it's just going to fall over. So the crane actually has something called reaction forces, which are going to be at the base of the crane. So I would call these R1 and R2. Now, there's going to be a bunch of different type of reaction forces depending on the support conditions. 
As we're going to see, there's going to be three different support conditions that we deal with in this class, but they're actually really simple, so you guys don't have to worry too much. Now, the last thing that we have to do, of course, is give it some dimensions. After that, the crane's looking pretty sexy, or I guess the free body diagram's looking pretty sexy, and then you guys probably have maybe around 20% of the marks for that particular question. So the professor's happy because you guys know what you're doing, and you're happy because you guys get the marks. Now, last thing that we are going to discuss in this is which way do these forces go? Remember I said that for these truss elements, they have an axial load. But we know that members can either be in tension or compression. So if we were to label it pointing away, we are assuming that the member there is actually in tension. But is it actually in tension? Well, that's something we need to discuss. So let's go to something what we call sign convention. Now, for axial members or these truss members, we always assume that, assume that the force points away from the object. So that's going to be the key here. In all those free body diagrams, we assume that our force is pointing away. This means that we are going to assume that the member is in tension. And I keep saying assume because it's an assumption. Now, I know you guys are going to say, ha, Clayton, you know what they say about assumptions. Yeah, yeah, I know, but don't worry. This one's kind of mathematically based. So let's talk about what it means to be in tension. Well, tension, we say something is in tension if it makes our body longer. All right, so let's say that we have our nice body. We put two tensile forces on it. We expect that this is going to start expanding in tension. You guys are saying, Clayton, well, of course that is. That's obvious. I'm not a six-year-old. Yeah, I know, but I need to include it on for the, <laughs> the accreditation. So <laughs> bear with me for a moment. So the second thing, of course, is compression. So tension makes the body longer. Compression, as you guys may guess, it's going to start compressing the body. So let's say that this is our original body. After we compress it, it's going to shrink down to something like this. Again, very trivial, but now you guys have a good understanding of tension or compression. Now, the reason why we assume tension is this. When we do all of our calculations, the math is actually going to be on our side. Now, this very rarely happens. Remember, math usually doesn't like us, but in this case, it wants to be friendly, which is great for us. So when we do our calculations and we assume tension, if we solve our member and we get that it's positive, it means that it actually is in tension, which is great. So every time you see a positive answer, it means tension. Now, if we do all of our calculations and our answer is actually negative, well, that actually means it's in compression. So every time we get a positive answer, it means tension. Every time we get a negative answer, it means it's in compression. So it's a very common sign convention and allows us to very easily determine whether something's in tension or it's in compression. Now, I have to make one note here because I may have scared a lot of students when I talked about making a body longer or making a body shorter. One thing that we're dealing with in this course is the idea of something called rigid bodies, which means that things actually do not deform. Even though I showed things deforming, they actually don't deform in reality or the deformation is actually very, very tiny. I'm going to take my clicker as an example. If I were to take both ends and I'm going to start pulling it, oh, that kind of made everything go crazy there. Give me a second. <laughs> Oops. If I were to start pulling it, it's in tension right now, but you don't see it start to elongate. It's very stiff. Now, I can do the same, and I can take it, and I can put it into compression now. The member right now is in compression, but it's actually not elongating. So the idea of something being tension or compression, we don't have to actually see it expand or contract, but it can still be in tension or compression. So something to be aware of. Now, last thing that we're going to talk about before we get into the, the tricks are support conditions. As I said, we need support conditions on things or else they're just going to fly away. If I were to take the clicker and push on it, well, there's no resistance. I can just push it away. But if I had a support condition, let's say a wall, and I were to take my clicker and try and push, well, the wall is going to provide that resistance to the clicker so it doesn't move. So in this particular case, even though I have an external force on this side, and a reaction force on this side, notice that the clicker is not moving, so it's static. So this is going to be the whole idea here, where the majority of the problems that we deal with, we're going to be applying external loads, which we know, and the goal is going to be solving for those support reactions, knowing that the resultant force must be equal to zero. But the question is, what are these support reactions or support conditions? There's going to be three major ones that we're going to talk about. The first one is called pins. Now pins are going to be perhaps the most common 
and they're gener generally represented by a triangle. Now this is nice because pins provide two things. One is horizontal restriction and the other one is vertical restriction. So this stops our object from moving in both the horizontal direction as well as the vertical direction. Best way I do it is I just put my pen, pencil, through the hole of a ruler like this. And as we can see, if I were to pull, it's not moving in the horizontal direction. And if I were to pull upwards, it's not moving in the vertical direction. But notice one thing, when I start changing the force, it can still rotate. So this is gonna be the key here. It provides good horizontal restriction as well as vertical restriction, but it does not stop any sort of rotation. Now, how would we model this with forces? Well, it's very simple. If we're providing horizontal and vertical restriction, we have two forces to kind of counteract that. So every time I see a pin, I can replace it with two forces. One is going to be a vertical force to restrict any vertical movement, and the second one is going to be a horizontal force to restrict any horizontal movement. Now, a more simple version of a pin is what we call a roller. Now, these are generally represented with a circle. But sometimes, and I have to kind of make a disclaimer here, sometimes you guys will see a triangle with little circles underneath. If you guys see those little circles, it's definitely going to be a roller. Now, rollers provide only one restriction, all right? So it provides only horizontal or vertical restriction. This means that if this was my beam again, a roller would be something like putting it at the bottom here. So notice how if I press downwards, it's not moving vertically, but if I were to move it side to side, it can still move side to side. Now, the question is, which way does it restrict? Well, the way it actually restricts is based upon the ground the roller is set on. So in this particular case, since my ground is flat, I'm providing vertical restriction. So I would say that the reaction force is something like Ry. But if my ground was inclined, something like this, well, the reaction force is going to incline with it. So the reaction force is always going to be perpendicular to the ground. But nevertheless, as we can see, we're only providing restriction in one direction. Pins, two directions. Rollers, one direction. Now, the question becomes, what is the third type? Well, the third type is going to be something called fixed condition. Now, fixed condition provides both the restrictions that a pin does, so it restricts it from both horizontal translation as well as vertical translation, but it also stops rotation. Remember, when we talked about our pin, which we said is like this, we said that it's still free to rotate. A fixed condition actually takes care of that because it basically clamps one end. So I can't pull it uh, horizontally, I can't pull it vertically, but I can't rotate it either. All right, so that's gonna be the key here. So what kind of forces would this look like? Well, it's gonna, of course, have the same ones as a pin because it's providing that horizontal and vertical restriction. So I'm gonna have a horizontal force and a vertical force but it's also gonna provide something called a reaction moment. Now, don't be scared. Moments are something we haven't seen before, but we're gonna be talking about them next week. So something we haven't seen, but we'll be talking about it next week, so it's, it's nothing to be scared about. And that moment is actually what counteracts any sort of rotation. Now you guys are saying, all right, Clayton, it doesn't look too bad. Can I have an example? Well, of course you can. So let's say that we have our beam and we apply two external loads on the beam. Now again, these external loads are gonna be something we typically know, all right? So P1, P2 is something you're typically going to be given in the question. And the goal of the question is going to say, what are the support conditions at both A and B? Well, this is gonna be simple, because what we're going to do is we're gonna take our beam, we're gonna apply all our loads, and we're going to convert all of those support conditions into equivalent loads. So if we look at the left-hand side, we have a pin. Now we know that a pin provides two support conditions, AX as well as AY, so a vertical and a horizontal force. Now if we look at B, it's a circle, which means it's a roller, and it's only going to provide that vertical condition. So a very uh, common problem you guys will see, and this will be more later on, is we now know what P1 and P2 are. How do we solve for those support conditions? So AX, AY, as well as by. Again, this is something we're gonna tackle a little bit later, but this is just showing you guys what we use these support conditions for. Now you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, support conditions, that's a piece of cake. If I have some sort of scenario where I have a pin or a fixed connection in my free body diagram, I know which forces to put on that free body diagram. Everything's pretty good. And I say, yeah, you're right. So those aren't really going to be a problem. 
problems start to occur in what I call special members. Now, <laughs> it's, it's not a good type of special, it's a bad type of special because these are where students start having problems in these special members because if they give you these special members, they follow a unique set of rules and if you guys don't know these rules, chances are you're not going to be able to solve the question. In the next video, we're going to be discussing something called particle equilibrium. Now, in particle equilibrium, we have two equations. And two equations means that we can solve for two unknowns. So every problem that we have in the, in the next following example, there should only be two unknowns. With these special cases, it gives professors the ability to add three unknowns. And most students will say, I have two equations, three unknowns, I don't know what to do. So that's when they start crying in the midterm or something like that. But we have to remember these special members because these allow us to take it from three unknowns back down to two unknowns. So the first one is something called a pulley. So a pulley, assuming frictionless, and at least at the University of Alberta, they're always frictionless. If they're, if they're not frictionless where you guys come from, let me just be the first to apologize. That's, that's very, very mean. But pulleys, assuming frictionless, only change the direction of a force and not the magnitude. So let's say that I have a pulley here, and as we can see in purple, we have two ropes. So we know that we're gonna have two forces on both sides. Now this is the idea where we professors use these to introduce an additional unknown, because most students will look at this and say, oh Clayton, I have two forces in this pulley that I need to figure out. But we have to remember that pulleys only change the direction of a force and not the magnitude. This means if that left-hand side was equal to P, well, the right-hand side must also equal P. So in pulley cases, even though there's two forces present on the pulley, the forces are the exact same. So there's only one unknown. So that's gonna be the first trick, pulleys. The second one is a more obvious trick, which is cable, ropes, and wires. So remember before we said that if we calculate things and we get a positive answer, it means it's in tension. And if we calculate and get a negative answer, it means it's in compression. Well, forever dealing with a rope, wire, or cable, these will always be in tension, and that makes sense. I took my iPhone charger right here, and if I were to pull in tension, I get resistance. It's great. But if I were to try compressing it, it provides no resistance at all. These, The idea of ropes, cables, and wires, they're only for tension. So if you guys have a case where you're calculating the forces in a rope or a wire, and you guys get it to be negative, well, something's wrong, because they should always be in tension. So that's kind of a more simple one. And again, it's very easy to show. You just take a wire, try putting it in compression. You're, you're gonna have a bad time, <laughs> let's be honest. Now the third case, and this is by far the most hated case. So don't worry, I will have an example for this spe specific case, and that is springs. All right, springs, springs are always the worst. So the force in a spring can actually be determined using a separate formula. Remember when I said that next week or next video, we're gonna discuss how to solve for these forces and we have two equations, which means we can solve for two unknowns. Well, if we have a spring, it's going to introduce a third unknown. And we have to keep in mind that for springs, they actually have their own separate equation to solve for the forces in these springs. And that is this, where the force in the spring is equal to K times delta X. Now in this particular case, or I guess all cases for I'm thinking ahead to graduate courses. As you guys are going to see, this won't always be the case, but for this course, it'll always be the case because it's linear elastic. K is going to be the spring constant. So it's going to be a constant value and it's going to have units of force per distance. So if you're in Canada, it'll be something like newtons per meter. If you're in the States, it'll be feet per, no, pound per feet, something like that. The States uh, system of measurement always gets me a little bit mixed up. Uh, yeah, I don't know, get a little bit confused all the time. But yeah, so it's going to be something like that. Now this delta x, this is going to be the change in length of the spring. So it's not going to be the current length. It's not going to be the initial length, but that change in length. That's why I have the formula as L, which is its current deformed length minus its initial or undeformed length. So this is very simple. So in a spring case, you're going to have three unknowns. And again, that's where all students freak out. Because remember, we can only solve for two unknowns. But you guys say, oh wait, I got a special formula for springs, which allows me to solve for the force in the spring. So once I know that force, I go back down to two unknowns, I got my two equations, I'm good to go. So those are going to be the special members to consider. Now again, the best way to learn this is going to be through examples. So down below, I will have an example for pulleys. I will have an example for springs, 
and everything else. Well, actually, I won't in this particular video because this is free body diagrams, but in the next video, I will show you guys how to cover springs as well as pulleys, etc. Down below in this video, I will have a video showing you guys just some free body diagram examples where we have a bunch of situations and how do we make the correct free body diagram. But yeah, that's it for this video. Again, I hope it was more fun than the last video because now we're actually taking what we learned in the first two weeks and they're now applying it to actual engineering applications, which are great. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't see any applications. And you're right, this video didn't show them the best, but next video, once we discuss equilibrium, it'll become much more apparent. So I just wanna thank you guys so much for listening. I hope I was able to show you something. If not, I'm sorry for wasting your time. Uh, yeah, you can blame the University of Alberta, don't blame me. <laughs> All right, so that's going to be it for this video. Thank you guys so much for listening. I will see you guys in the next video.